Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, just let get a few more people who are in the waiting room, if we can get everyone in. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Thank you all so much indeed for joining uh, this uh, Teal Fest session for Tell in the Arts. Um, my name is Professor Michael Scott. I'm a professor in the Department of Classics at the University of Warwick. Um, and uh, I have been working with uh, a number of people through the University of Warwick uh, over the past several years on a number of different modules within the department that have employed technology uh, in a number of different ways and I wanted to share with you this morning uh, two uh, experiences that I've had using technology in different ways in order to particularly uh, get students uh, not only motivating their own individual research projects um, but as a result personalizing their learning journeys and most importantly for me given my background and belief in the importance of uh, public engagement as part of the work of academics and wanting to see public engagement as part of the undergraduate student experience as well um, using technology to give students a real opportunity to uh, offer something to the public as a result of their own studies. Um, so uh, what I've done is mute everyone uh, so far. Um, we do have a Zoom group chat though that I'm going about to send uh, an original uh, first file uh, to you uh, all um, and then there'll be some further files shared during the session. Uh, if you do have questions at any point please do put them through the Zoom group chat uh, and thus and then we will be able uh, to share those questions with everyone. Uh, the first file that's coming to you now is just an overview of the things that we will be covering and some uh, also some web addresses for you as well just finishing off uh, entering allowing some more participants to join um, and so what I'm going to do first is take you to the Greek religion module um, that uh, I've been running here at the University of Warwick for the last four or five years um, and uh, I will now go to share the screen uh, so you should be able to see uh, once I've shared the screen here, um, the archaeological sites database. So what you're looking at at the moment uh, is uh, the uh, Classics and Ancient History departmental website, the outward facing website. While we use Moodle now for most uh, of our uh, courses, um, this particular aspect of the Greek religion course has been kept within a public facing website because of, as I underlined, the importance of the work that students are doing being public facing going forward. As part of their year-long module uh, in relation to Greek religion, uh, they, the students are asked to construct and fill in a template about a particular religious archaeological site uh, around the ancient Mediterranean world. And you can see the long list um, here of places that have been filled in. Um, if we go to one of those options, to the Amphiraean at Oropos, you get a better sense um, of what they are asked to do. Uh, a template is created in which there are particular forms uh, and uh, to fill in, archaeological development, uh, we can go down through to gods and heroes, um, and each student has undertaken their own personal research journey to put together the information required here uh, for ritual activity, uh, uh, for and then the evidence for that, uh, going through down into festivals, to rules and regulations, uh, other activities, um, historical significance of the sites, um, who used the sites and where did they come from, followed by select site bibliography. And here you can see that the students have had to not only uh, offer uh, up uh, kind of where they have got their images from uh, and, and offer a kind of, uh, you know, a template that one can follow as to where all the images that you can see here on the right hand side have come from, uh, but they also have to then offer their evidence, their primary sources, uh, here you can see and their secondary sources um, followed by any online sources they've used in particular and then followed by particular footnotes to ensure that there's an academic rigor to the material that they have been creating. 
Uh, now, this has been uh, run uh, not as a formal part of the assessment of the module at any point. This is at most uh, what we would call up to 10% of their module mark and thus uh, less of a formal point of assessment, or indeed it's been an additional project on top of their formal assessment throughout uh, the year-long module. But what we feel this gives them in a very, very simple employment of technology in a template, a website template, is the ability for students to sharpen their own research skills on a project which is semi-personalized. There are a, a long list of options provided for them at the beginning of the year and then they choose the particular archaeological site that interests them to personally go away, research and then put together um, the material for. It gives them a series of basic digital website skills um, but most importantly and what I'm particularly focused on here is that they are asked to think about what they are writing um, because they need to write it in a register designed for a public audience, for a non-specialist audience. Um, and this is something that the students often find quite challenging uh, because it's challenging them to think about what their assumptions are about what other people already know um, and what they don't know in terms of who they are writing for. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it, it has been a very successful project and often the students come back and feel that this is something uh, that they particularly enjoy doing. More, most importantly, perhaps it's something that they can point to in the external non-facing university digital world um, for parents and friends and family but equally also for employers uh, down the line that uh, they can point to as having uh, put together. And we know that uh, these entries uh, that the students have created are being used uh, by wide members of the uh, members of the public, not just for particular interest, but equally particularly right now uh, in terms of uh, homeschooling. Um, so if I can take you over to our second website page, this is the page of the Warwick Classics Network, which is uh, our uh, outreach and engagement arm um, that I run in conjunction with Dr. Paul Grigsby um, and we have here a whole series of online resources that have been put together um, to work uh, and help with schools, school teachers across the country and across the world that has come into particular use as you can imagine in the recent uh, COVID-19 uh, quarantine and homeschooling era of which um, the archaeological site database here is one of those home resources. So we are actively employing the resources that our students create as part of their modules here also as part of our outreach and and engagement uh, um, work. Um, at the same time, um, I can then take you over to uh, the second project that I wanted to flag with you today, which is to do with ancient global history. Um, so if uh, there are any questions about uh, the Greek archaeological sites database, very happy to take them through the Zoom group chat um, or indeed via email afterwards if you'd like to email me on m.c.scott uh, at uh, warwick.ac.com. UK. I'm very happy to answer those questions. Um, so the second project that I wanted to flag with you and spend a little bit more time on is the Ancient Global History Project module and particularly uh, the digital aspect of this module which is uh, its engagement with oiko.world. So oiko.world, if I can take you to uh, the main web page here, um, is you, and you can visit this uh, and, and play with it at your leisure, what we are seeking to do uh, in this, uh, this website which was created between 2016 and 2018 with the help of two Warwick uh, Impact Strategic Funding um, Awards uh, in conjunction with Warwick academic technologists, particularly Steve Ramford and indeed external computer company Computer Minds and particularly Stephen Jones. My thanks uh, to them for their uh, work, ongoing work on this project. Um, this uh, oiko.world is designed again as a public facing tool tool to help uh, the public understand something of the connected nature of different communities and civilizations in antiquity stretching from the Mediterranean to China. Uh, this is uh, interacting to sort of counteract, if you like, the isolated way in which we study history and in particular in which in the way not only the research of different uh, civilizations is constructed but equally as a result departments are constructed. In the Department of Classics we so often spend time thinking about the worlds of Greece and Rome but we do not think about the worlds with which they were heavily uh, 
kind of engaged, interacting, uh, and uh, were affected by, particularly in Asia, India, and China. Uh, my research has, has sort of gone in this direction of ancient global history over the past couple of years and as a result I wanted to construct a public facing tool uh, that enabled people to understand something of those connections. Um, so what we have here is oiko.world which you can visit in two formats, the geographical view that we have here and as you can see along the bottom of uh, the page and you can have a play with this later, you can move the uh, time frame through and different events appear as they're constructed or indeed you can search for them uh, in uh, the uh, top hand bar. Um, so if we take an example of the pilgrimage of Faxian happening in 399 uh, CE, you begin to see the sorts of information that oiko.world can offer. Different kinds of events uh, as uh, shown by the different colored markers, linked by the different arrows, in this case the pilgrimage of Faxian, seen in a geographical format on the map, which can then also be looked at in in terms of greater detail through the text that is entered here on the pullout left hand side and it's here that those connections can really be seen because what you then get is a series of places that you can go to have a look at that are that Faxian visited as part of his pilgrimage um, so we could be uh, heading and also people that he interacted with so if we go to Chandragupta the second of the Gupta Empire that brings you to his uh, marker uh, and then you get to see all the events that he was in particularly involved uh, with, then perhaps you can choose to have a look at the Gupta Empire as a wider group, um, and that will bring up further information as well. Um, Len allows for discussion and sharing between the two here. Um, we've had a question in, if I can just pull up the uh, Zoom group chat from Sam. Do professors check the information students write on the archaeological database to see whether it is accurate? Um, uh, thanks very much indeed, Sam, for, for that question. Yes, what we do um, in terms of the Greek archaeological site database entry is that um, the students, when they have put together their website entries, we then have a student presentation um, in the classroom with uh, the module leader um, and any work that then needs to be corrected corrected is corrected um, and and informed uh, we also have for instance uh, tour groups private tour companies that have asked whether they can use uh, the student entries for the Greek archaeological site databases as part of the information that they're providing um, forward uh, to the public and, and making available to people as they take people to the different sites that are mentioned um, so we have a variety of different uh, people uh, and groups that are using this information so Sam very, very many thanks for that question. Um, I can, uh, we were just here with the oiko.world database so you can have a play around with this yourselves in the future and uh, you can engage with the material both via a geographical view uh, but you can also if you go down here to the bottom left you can uh, engage with it via a chronological uh, view and particularly via comparative timelines. Um, so if I uh, just uh, lose this one so we can add load the timeline of China um, and we can have that uh, compared with the Roman Empire for instance uh, and so this should hopefully be coming up there and, and then by uh, playing around you can go in in ever closer detail um, to what is going on within particular time periods as you can see here along the top. So this website is designed to give people a real way into starting to compare and contrast events that are happening um, across vast different geographical distances but also to start thinking about the connections uh, between those communities and individuals. Um, what I'm going to uh, share with you now is the way in which we have turned oiko.world um, into uh, a um, uh, something that can be added uh, to uh, the formal assessment um, of um, the, uh, if I can find where my show, oh, here it is. Uh, chat button. There we go. Uh, should be able to find a uh, way of which um, the 
uh, oiko.world can be used as part of formal assessment within the module of ancient global history as it was run for the first time in 1819 um, in the uh, University of Warwick in the Department of Classics. We had 55 or so students taking the module in 2018-19 uh, and I worked very closely with Steve Ranford of Warwick Academic Technology to um, turn oiko.world into something that could be a formal uh, assessment point that met all the requirements of the university in terms of academic rigor and um, ensuring that it was the students own work that was being submitted um, definitively done by them uh, to be, become part of oiko.world and if I share now with you a second version of oiko.world we're now kind of a little bit behind the scenes of oiko.world um, and uh, we uh, are here um, to uh, uh, now in the editing room if you can see we have a whole series of different um, editing tools that have come across the top uh, of the page um, and in particular what you get to see here is an edit button uh, so students when they were logged in through their Warwick student sign-on IDs were thus then able to access the uh, add new CDOC entity, add new narrative and view transcript page. Um, add new CDOC entity is where they chose particular new points of information that were not within the oiko.world database um, and uh, they choose that chose them to research those um, and develop new entries within the database. We then asked them also to link their new entries with a particular narrative. So it couldn't just be three random entries, it needed to be three entries that were related to one another in some way. Uh, they had to construct a narrative to explain uh, what that uh, addition was, um, uh, what that connective uh, tissue was. Um, and then at the end, they had a transcript which they could um, export from oiko.world as a PDF and be able to submit through the normal Warwick um, tabular si um, uh, submission system systems uh, for formal uh, work. Um, now, obviously, this required the students to uh, have a, a higher level of digital skills um, than the Greek archaeological site database. Um, and so this required us to share uh, quite a lot of information with them, um, which we did through a series of both text documents and indeed one-to-one uh, -one classes. So I'm sharing with you now um, the oiko.world um, option C, as it was known, uh, crib, um, which gives you a sense of the kind of level of detail of information that was available to uh, all the students who were engaging with this. A real step-by-step -step guide for how to um, navigate this system, add their entities um, and construct their narrative. So we were supporting these students throughout very carefully um, to make sure that the, they were not in any way held back um, from a digital perspective. The students had got to personalise their learning journey, um, as you can see by the, the choice of uh, their own particular entries. They first had to look through oiko.world, see what was there, see what was not there, um, and uh, then come up with their own ideas. They then had to go away and research those. Um, and then, of course, they had the job of putting it into oiko.world um, and creating the narratives. And then alongside that, we also asked the students to write a reflective essay. Um, um, so the students created their three entries, created the narrative, and then wrote a reflective essay, both on their experience of creating those entries, and we were very pleased to see that some of the reflective essays came back with some strong and fair criticism of the way the website allows entries to be constructed that will be taken forward in the next stages of development, but also getting them to reflect on how they felt that the image, the picture of global connectivity that oiko.world seeks to offer, how that had changed, as a result of um, uh, their particular entry. So what difference did they feel they had, make, they had made uh, to um, the, the kind of the picture that oiko.world was offering? And of course, part of the assessment again was uh, the students thinking quite carefully about the register with which they wrote their entries. Um, so I'm gonna share with you one further file, um, which is a, a student's um, final submission um, for their assessment in this module, uh, which is all uh, done by student ID only. Um, and you'll get uh, both the uh, entry 
pieces that they put together uh, and how it was exported as a transcript, but you will also get the reflective essay um, that uh, they uh, put together at the end as well. Now, this particular student was working on Hang Han Xiongnu marriage alliances. Um, and we can, if we go into content here, a little bit behind the scenes uh, of oiko.world, we can uh, bring up their particular um, entry. This is what they were seeing that they had finally constructed before they exported their transcript. Um, and uh, this is the narrative uh, chain uh, text that you can see here at the beginning. Um, that they came up with um, to link their three individual entries, which are under key events, uh, the marriage of Wang Sujian, the marriage of Zhang Xian, and the marriage proposal of Empress Lu. Um, and then it brought in their particular chronological time frame that they've been working on, geographical locations, and then it goes into the individual entries that they created in the database in some detail. Um, so here, starting uh, with the marriage of Wang Xiaojun. Um, and you can start to see uh, the different levels of detail that they had to enter, along with a series of uh, kind of narrative text to explain the context, activity and outcome and thus importance of this particular entry. Um, and as uh, we can now show you sort of back out of the, of the editing uh, world, uh, if I go back to uh, where we were here um, in oiko.world and I now search for uh, one of those students' entries, um, I should be able uh, to, <laughs> except I've misspelled marriage, haven't I? There we go. Um, uh, there we go. Uh, Zhang Tian. So one of these entries that the student created is now completely public facing here in oiko.world and you can see exactly that same text that the student uh, had created here, context, uh, activity um, and outcome. Uh, here ready for the public to see. Um, so what we found uh, with this is that students were obviously asked to think about uh, the particular topics they were asked to research, often very difficult and unfamiliar topics to them um, within uh, kind of their normal uh, learning journeys of, of the Greek and Roman worlds to which they took um, with gusto. I was very pleased to, to see. Um, but what came out of that also was then a uh, a need to focus on how to package their information particularly for the public and once again question their assumptions about what uh, the public may or may not know and understand um, and particularly this is uh, of importance when dealing with uh, worlds that are often much less familiar to the public and particularly the western public than uh, the, uh, the Mediterranean world um, and then to put that within the form uh, of the database and to work through the particular digital ways in which the database works, um, supported by us to ensure that they were able to complete their assessments, um, and then to reflect on that process as well um, through their reflective essay, uh, bringing that all together, um, as you can see in the submission that I've shared with you. Um, so what we found, uh, and we did a number of video reports working with students who did this um, at the end of the module, and. Um, I can share uh, the um, uh, link to that video report uh, with you here as well now if I uh, more academic. bring this up for you now um, and I should be able to share this module link with you as well. Um, so yes, if you go here, this is the final report from the uh, Warwick um, Institute of Advanced Teaching and Learning, um, which I've shared with you now as a website address uh, through Zoom group chat, uh, which has an executive summary, um, but equally most importantly here uh, has a final report video, which you can watch in which students reflect on the different aspects of the module and particularly engaging with oiko.world. Uh, and what I thought was particularly useful here was that students not only came out of the oiko.world project and um, encouraged, having been challenged first off, but also very encouraged by the fact that they had been able to acquire such digital skills, uh, encouraged um, by the fact that they had been able to research things that were very personal and of particular interest to them. 
Um, and uh, then uh, indeed uh, they were encouraged by the fact that they had been able to do something which was public facing. Um, and once again, uh, we found that students going forward have really appreciated this public facing aspect, thinking about employability skills and going forward into the job market, something that they can point to going forward um, that they have been able to accomplish. Um, and so we also uh, were particularly um, uh, Perhaps I, kind of, I, I, I certainly hadn't anticipated this beforehand, but we also had a number of people taking the module who had a series of learning differences. Um, and uh, they ranged from different forms of dyslexia um, through to ADHD, et cetera. Um, and these students in particular reported that they enjoyed not only the fact that this was a different form of assessment from which they were normally confronted within the arts, which is often the essay, um, and thus uh, variety is the spice of life and they enjoyed that variety, but actually the particular way of entering data into oiko.world uh, appealed to many of the people with learning differences um, and really felt that they were able to kind of um, unleash their own uh, kind of vim and vigor on the topic um, and thus um, they felt that they had been able to perform much more to the best of their abilities through this alternative assessment portal um, than um, in the traditional essay that was being offered. Um, so uh, what I would like to uh, do in the remaining few minutes that we have is take any questions um, through the, the uh, Zoom chat um, that you uh, might have um, on either oiko.world or, or indeed the Greek Archaeological Site database um, or indeed on other aspects of technology and the arts. I'm aware that this is a very brief session um, and it's been very much coming from my perspective of teaching uh, ancient history uh, within uh, a department of classics um, and bringing in technology hopefully in two main ways, uh, both very, in, in many ways, very basic uses of technology um, for students, and, but with a particular focus on um, creating something at the end of the day, which is public facing, permanently uh, viewable and visible to the wider world, which students can refer back to, both during the course of uh, their degree, but equally once they leave the university um, and uh, are working in a much wider global world. So. Um, Please, please, please do uh, offer up any questions you have over uh, the Zoom chat uh, feature. Um, otherwise, I am, as I've said, very, very happy to take questions uh, in the future via email to m.c.scott uh, at warwick.ac.uk. Um, otherwise, um, I wish you a very, very uh, good rest of the day um, and a good rest of Tealfest. Uh, we've had a quick question from Rebecca uh, Timon coming in. Do you think this approach could work for A-level? Um, I'd love to run something similar on a smaller scale but would be unsure of the public facing platform that we could use but the college website might be the place so yes i i think that um my work so far in with undergraduate students and i think this applies to school students as well is that uh, it is not only the old adage of it's not just understanding something enough to understand it yourself but to understand something enough to teach it and communicate it to other people means you have to understand it even more uh, that makes a, a kind of a public facing activity incredibly valuable. Uh, at all ages um, and so I think this would be particularly useful also at school level. Um, I think you're absolutely right that uh, and as we did for the Greek archaeological site database you don't need a complex website that's designed expressly for the purpose. Uh, for the Greek archaeological site database we use the simple departmental uh, forward facing websites sort of under the, the modules tab um, and so you could use the college website platform as well. Providing a, a template for the web page gives students a bit of frame but a framework for the kinds of work that you want them to do. Uh, I think asking them to do that work and then present that work themselves within class and thus get feedback both from teachers and from students is a very, very useful way of uh, ensuring that the students take uh, pride in the work that they're putting together and forward. Um, and uh, then it also gives you an opportunity to quality check it before it um, goes out into the wider world. Uh, and it shouldn't be too much of a 
problem for you, the school IT services to provide you a bit of a, a sandpit, as it were, so students can be putting these website pages together, um, but then kind of only once you're happy with them, can you press a button and they go forward into the public view. The same happens uh, with our work in oiko.world, so all the student um, submissions are within a, a sort of protected sandpit, if you like, until they've been marked as part of formal assessment, uh, and it's only once they've been marked okay and indeed sometimes students given the opportunity to correct things that I then allow those uh, entries to go forward into uh, the public space of Oiko. Um, Tamsin, the Oiko uh, world site seems like something that's been up and running for a while. You adapted it in the last few months in response to COVID-19. Um, yes, so Oiko was sort of created back in 2017 uh, and has been developed using database entries with students where I've been working with students with groups of students every year um, entering more data within the system. 1819 was the first year that we used it as part of uh, a formal module assessment. Um, we haven't adapted it in the last few months, although you'll be pleased to know we have seen a large increase in the number of users um, in the last couple of months uh, as everyone's homeschooling and looking for resources. And Oiko.world, of course, also feeds into our um, uh, STOA database of school resources for the Warwick Classics Network. Um, in terms of changes and foreseeing in the future, we're, we're going to have to respond, I think, to a number of the issues that students brought up in their reflective essays uh, about both the entry side of the data um, and making that a bit more intuitive um, and a bit more flexible, responding to the nature of the kinds of data that they're trying to enter. Um, but equally, kind of on the on the public delivery side of things, um, I would like to uh, kind of make uh, particularly the geographical map side more interactive uh, and more uh, intuitive in terms of the kinds of information that it's displaying. Um, and equally, we could up always, of course, up and increase the kinds of content um, and kinds of linkages. Um, so linking not just within oiko.world, but perhaps even indeed linking to external sites as well, to objects within museum, online museum collections, uh, so that people could move around between different um, resources of information. Uh, Chris Rowe has asked, what sort of length of individual presentation do you request from students? Um, if we're doing the Greek archaeological site database, normally I'm requesting from students sort of 10, 10 minutes or so. So it's not presenting all their information, but once they have presented it in the archaeological site database, to then think carefully about what they think are the most important points um, and then to present those um, within a shorter presentation model. So it's asking students in that sense to do two uh, levels of sifting. They've got to do their own research first, work out what they think is important for the public facing web page uh, uh, template, but then sift again to think what they want to communicate particularly to their fellow students um, going forward. Uh, so thank you indeed very much for those questions. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, Rebecca, uh, how long do you give them to do it? Um, in terms of the uh, archaeological site database, uh, we normally run the project over a term. Uh, so we uh, start and deliver uh, and sort of di divvy up the different archaeological sites that are available at the beginning of the second term. So giving students uh, a term, the autumn term, to get up to speed with the module and with the issues of Greek religion. Um, then in the second term, this, this uh, runs, if you like, from the beginning of the term through to normally sort of week seven or eight uh, of a 10 week term. So giving students enough time to do the research, uh, create uh, their entries, and then of course do the presentations as well. Um, so I think you can long, you can make that longer or shorter depending on kind of how much time you want to give the students to do it at any one moment in time and how long, how how much you think your students are going to be able to carry that kind of self-motivated research um, in the background. Uh, I think that's a very important question as well. Um, but uh, it, it, that's, uh, that is the kind of length that we offer the, the undergraduates. Um, that is also because, of course, it's not a official formal part of their assessment for the module. They're also doing that on top of it. So we're giving them perhaps a little bit extra time um, as to, to, to balance out their workload. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for your questions. Um, I'm aware that we're, we're now slightly over time for the for the half hour uh, session that we had scheduled. Um, and again, um, I'm very, very happy to take any further questions that you may have through um, m.c.scott at warrior.ac.uk. Um, but in the meantime, um, what I will do is to say thank you all very much indeed uh, for your time um, and to wish you not only uh, that you stay alert, uh, which we're all getting very familiar with now, uh, but stay safe um, and stay 
stay well. Um, so thank you indeed uh, very much to you all and have a great uh, rest of the day. Um, I'll now stop a, a share of the screen um, and uh, I will end this meeting as well. Thank you very much indeed. Take care.